Hi, my name is Nate Ernest Noble. Um, I'm a quantum computing application researcher at IBM. Uh, I just want to say, one, thank you for inviting me out here, CQC. This has been a really good talk. I've learned a lot of interesting things. And I think that this area of NLP is a really interesting possibility for applications with quantum computing. Um, one thing I, oh, it's cutting it off up there. You might miss some things on the left. But one, one thing uh, I think is really interesting about this field is just the diversity of backgrounds. Um, and to that spirit, my talk's a bit outside of the fold. It's going to be a hardware-specific talk. Um, specifically, I'm going to be talking about OpenPulse. So OpenPulse is the part of Kiskit, our software stack, that gives you direct control access to the hardware. So you can control the microwave tones that actually control the qubits. Quick overview. So I'm going to start off talking about the hardware, explaining what sort of platform we actually end up using and the roadmap that we have for this hardware. Then I'm going to talk about how you control that hardware, which is the thing that you can do with OpenPulse. And then I'm going to try and give some motivations as to why people who are interested in algorithms should find this interesting. Uh, so some of the applications that you can do with it. So starting off at the end, um, if this wasn't cut off, it would say short depth circuits on the right here. So one big thing where pulse control or pulse level access to the hardware will be useful is that you can start to deploy this error mitigation technique called Richardson extrapolation, where you're going to take the pulses and just increase their duration. And then from that, you can end up getting better results. I'll say that it's important, though, that these circuits are short depth, because if you start dealing with circuits that have very large depth, you're going to be running into the decoherent errors of your qubits, which this technique doesn't help you correct for. With that, we're going to end up talking about the, the gates and how you do the measurement and what the qubits themselves are. So I'm going to talk about what are these lines, how, what is the actual physical realization IBM uses. We're going to talk about, say, the Hadamard gate or this control not gate. Specifically, these things are not actually native to the hardware. So sometimes it may not actually be good if you want to implement a C not gate if you don't need the full C not, the perfect bell state. And then we'll talk about how you actually do measurement in this process. So talking about qubit control and measurement. And then we're going to say, all right, how do we bring these things together? And now we can actually begin to characterize uh, the devices in a way that you couldn't do when you just had circuit level access. All right, so let's start off talking about the hardware and what, what all these elements actually are comprised of. So IBM uses circuit QED. This is the circuit equivalent of cavity QED, which won the Nobel Prize back in 2012. Uh, no one's won the Nobel Prize for this yet. We'll see if that happens. Um, but whereas cavity QED, you had a physical atom inside some cavity, now instead you're going to have an artificial atom, some superconducting circuit, inside a cavity, which is just this uh, LC resonator. IBM specifically uses the fixed frequency transmon qubit. So a fixed frequency transmon qubit is a single Josephson junction shunted by a large capacitor. Uh, this fixed frequency nature is useful because it actually helps you get much better coherence times than if you have a tunable transmon. But the tunability of transmons maybe has a different sorts of benefits, which I could talk about. The large capacitance, so this transmon is sort of the, the third generation of charge qubits. And this large capacitance helps suppress your sensitivity to charge noise. Um, and you can actually begin to uh, characterize that as well. Uh, so your LC resonator here um, is just going to be a harmonic oscillator where all your spacings are evenly spaced by h bar omega. Uh, that's great, but it won't let you make a qubit because you actually can't coherently drive your 0, 1 state. So by using this nonlinear Josephson element, you begin to make an anharmonic oscillator where these higher energy levels are, get clo more closely spaced as you go up. I'll say um, the operational frequency of these devices is roughly around 5 gigahertz. Um, I bring this up because it's important to realize that this has a temperature equivalent of 240 millikelvin. So a lot of the time I get asked this question of, oh, once we get better superconductors, can we do room temperature such things? And you may be able to, but you have to figure out how to decouple that from the thermal environment. So it doesn't necessarily just come for free. All right, so these linear resonators, you can't use them as qubits necessarily. You can encode some information in them, which is sort of bosonic degrees of freedom, which is interesting. Um, they also serve the purpose of being the readout bus of your qubit. So the frequency of this resonator is going to depend on the state of the qubit. And you can use that to read out. And I'll get into some details about that. Another important thing about it is that it actually serves as a noise filter. So if you didn't have this LC resonator on there, which is how this started back in the 90s, 
these Joseph injunctions will be directly coupled to the 50 ohm environment, and that's very noisy. By simply putting this LC resonator there, you sort of filter out that noise and you get much better coherence time. So this is actually a really important development. Not only that, um, at IBM, you can use these fixed frequency resonators as a way to couple two different qubits together. So this is sort of a resonator bus. And when you do that, you're gonna end up realizing a cross resonance gate for your two qubit gates. Um, in principle, though, you could take this and turn it into a tunable thing, which is what Google does say, and so you can have tunable couplers here. This is what some such device would end up looking like. So these light blue things here are coupling resonators, and then these resonators on the outside are the readout resonators. There may be such realizations where you end up having a single resonator coupled to many qubits for multiplexing purposes and dealing with frequency collisions, but in this specific thing, you end up having a resonator for each individual qubit. So up until recently, we were using this hexagonal lattice, and, which is just as you see here. Um, when you're trying to think about how to actually start scaling these things up into larger and larger systems, one issue that you start to deal with, particularly when you're using the fixed frequency realization that IBM has, is that you're gonna have a lot of frequency collisions. So recently, um, some folks, Andrew Cross and others at IBM, published this heavy hexagonal lattice we're actually going to sort of put qubits in the center here, and this um, ends up having two different pros. One, uh, it helps alleviate um, frequency collisions, so now you can actually start to scale these things up, and your fabrication sensitivities are a little bit easier to meet. Um, and then also it's gonna help with crosstalk issues, um, and I'll get into some details about the crosstalk and how we've used our knowledge of creating different generations of devices to understand the, the effect of crosstalk. Um, what also comes in this paper is a proposed fault-tolerant code, um, which ends up being an interesting mix of the Bacon Shore code um, and surface code. Um, all right, so as we've started to build these systems, building a singular quantum system that is large and good and operates in the way that you want it to is hard. To build two such things or five such things is not just two or five times harder, it's actually much harder than that. And you have to go, at least at the start, so you have to go through many generations and sort of learn where are things working well and where are things sort of falling apart. And I think that becomes really clear when you look at, say, our 20 qubit devices. So if you look at the first generation, you end up having these couplings where you try and sort of get, say, for this subgroup of qubits, all-to-all -all connectivity. Um, that's good so that you have to do less swapping gates or something like that. But when you end up having this all to all connectivity here, you end up getting a lot of crosstalk, at least when you're using the resonator buses that we use. Um, so you can see that we sort of use that to inform as we went higher and higher, and now we have this 53 qubit Rochester device. What, what's really cool and important about this is that as we've gone through these generations of devices, we've seen that we take, say, the C naught error distributions that we have in these, these devices, and we've actually been able to bring them down and reproduce them at being at very low values. So I think that this is cool and important because it's really showing that you can make an enterprise out of this and you can actually make many such devices that will be in this lower end such that you can actually get um, many people using it. Um, in particular with the 20 qubit devices, um, they, they are some of our best performing. The five and 20 qubit devices are some of our best uh, performing devices with the largest quantum volume. I think right now we're at about a quantum volume of 16. Okay, so I've talked a bit about the hardware and what's going on here, and now I actually wanna get into how do you do qubit readout in these devices and what does that actually end up looking like? So when doing qubit control and readout, first you send in some tone that does a gate on your qubit. I'll get into those details in a second. Then subsequently you do a readout measurement. And this is called two-tone spectroscopy or pulse probe or pump probe, it goes by a lot of different names. Um, What's important here is that the amplitude, the duration, the timing, and the frequency of these tones all matter when you're trying to calibrate these things up. So up to this point, you would do what's called measurement level zero, where you say, read out the state of your qubit, and you get either a zero or you get a one. You didn't care about what was going on back here. If you don't wanna care about it, that's still a perfectly fine option. Um, IBM would go and do the calibrations and try and tune these things up and they do it twice a day or so. 
But now you have the ability to actually start reading out the, the signals from the devices themselves and do that calibration yourself. So right here I've plotted, this is what would be called measurement level one, so going one step lower in your measurement capabilities, where you're just plotting the IQ plane of this microwave tone that you're reading out. And what I've done here is I've fixed some amplitude for my readout pulse and some duration. But this isn't very good. My zero and my one states here, so the blue clusters are when the qubit's in the zero state, the red clusters are when the qubit's in the one state, and they're, they're sort of blurred together. So you wouldn't actually get very good readout fidelity here. Well, not all hope is lost. I'll just go ahead and keep that amplitude fixed and increase the duration. So now I'm just taking that pulse that was originally 700 nanoseconds long, and now I'm going and increasing the duration to be, in this instance, four microseconds. And you can see you've had dramatic improvement in, in the ability to read out your zero or your one state. Um, th this benefit doesn't come forever. So if you just thought, oh, well, I don't know, there's some red dots right here. Maybe if I increase the, the readout duration for an even longer period of time, I'll get better readout fidelity. Unfortunately, if you increase your readout duration for too long, what you end up seeing, and it's not super obvious here, but what ends up happening is that the qubit will end up decaying during the readout process. So if I go ahead and, um, and it's basically how long is your readout relative to the T1 of the device. Fortunately, it's not very dramatic here because the T1s of our devices are fairly decent. Um, but if I turn this into 100 microseconds, most of the states would end up decaying down into the zero state. What's also interesting about this now is um, IBM has its own kernel where it helps decide whether you have a zero or one, and that's what you're getting up here. But now with this IQ measurement capabilities, you can go and construct your own kernel. So if you wanted to try and apply some interesting machine learning techniques and see if you can actually get better readout fidelity than 90%, that might be possible through some machine learning approach. Um, I think where the really interesting component will come, but isn't quite possible yet, is we're gonna eventually have this measurement level zero. So where here I do a measurement, say, for four microseconds, and I, it's this tone that's on for four microseconds, what you end up seeing here is you take that, whatever's going on in there, you average it all together, and then it ends up being some point on this IQ plane. With this measurement level zero, you'll be able to have that raw signal trace where you actually can sort of follow the dynamics of your qubit as you're reading it out, and I think that's where some machine learning might end up being really powerful to sort of help see some interesting dynamics that you wouldn't have seen before. Okay, so now talking about qubit control, and I'm gonna sort of blend into this the device characterization that you get with this qubit control. So with this, my goal is to sort of walk through prototypical gates and help understand how it is that we calibrate those gates. As I said before, same thing, it's the duration, the timing, the brightness or the amplitude and the color or frequency that matters for controlling these qubits. What that ends up looking like is you have some microwave tone that's going down these things. Again, it has some duration and some amplitude and we can shape these things in specific ways which I'll talk about in a second. Oh, um, so I'm gonna turn this tone on and let's just say I fix my duration and I'm gonna increase my amplitude slowly. Well, what you would see is the qubit would take, go from the zero state and then be rotated to the one state. But if I continue to increase my amplitude, it would just rotate back to the zero state. And then you'd get what are called Rabi oscillations here. And these Rabi oscillations are the prototypical thing that you do to begin to calibrate your X gate. So if I want to go from the zero to the one state, I find where I end up getting sort of this maximum oscillation here and then that is my X gate. And then you can finally adjust it as you, as you want to get this very precise. What this ends up looking like in open pulse is you're gonna have some pulse here. This is gonna be the qubit control with some, again, duration and some amplitude. And then you have some readout pulse as well. Um, what I wanna bring up here, so this is a Gaussian shaped pulse. You don't have to use a Gaussian shaped pulse, you can use a square pulse. You can use a very elaborate pulse that some machine learning algorithm just spits out and then says that it's gonna give you better fidelity. And that's actually some things that people are currently doing within, with our devices is trying to see, can we shape these pulses such that 
so, so we have to calibrate these devices once a day or so, twice a day. Well, the reason that you have to calibrate it is because there's slight drifts in the qubit's frequency. And that comes from two-level systems on the surface or whatever it may be. And so maybe you can actually construct some pulse here such that even though you have slight drifts, you're gonna get the optimal performance of the device. And so there's some interesting ways in which you can shape it, which I could talk about if you're interested. Once you do this pi pulse, now you can actually go ahead and start to do T1 measurements. The way that that ends up working is fairly obvious. Uh, you're gonna just pulse to your one state with this Robbie pulse, and then you're gonna take your measurement, and you're gonna just vary how long you wait before you read out the state of your qubit. And then you just get your prototypical T1 decay, decay curve. Um, so now, whereas IBM before was, go ahead, was just publishing these um, values whenever they do their calibrations, if you were so interested, you could sort of, within your quantum circuit, append something in the front to do this T1 measurement first because it's gonna vary throughout the day. Um, and then now you'll get the most updated value right when your circuit was running, which I think could be useful. So the X gate, you actually have to send in a pulse to, like, to flip the qubit from zero to one. The Z gate, fortunately, actually requires no microwave tone to go in whatsoever. Um, it's just implemented through the classical control electronics by adjusting the phase of those electronics, or you can adjust the timing, it's basically the same thing. The reason that that happens is that the, uh, when there, there's this thing called the rotating wave approximation where when you're going from the qubits frame of reference to the lab frame of reference, the qubits actually processing in the lab frame of reference, um, and that is where you, the reason that you don't actually need to implement any sort of tone directly. Um, so now if you combine the Z gate through classical electronics and the X gate with these pulses, you now get arbitrary single qubit preparation. So now we're, we're not quite at this point of universal gates because we still have to talk about these two qubit gates, but we now can put our qubit anywhere on the block sphere with just these two pulses or these two different gates. And so when you think about a Hadamard gate, what you're actually doing is you're taking that Robbie oscillation or that X pulse, and you're gonna do it halfway, so you're just gonna pulse it to the equator here, and then to get the precise Hadamard gate that you want, you end up just controlling the face. And then that prepares the, or does the Hadamard gate. Um, what you can also do with this is now begin to do uh, Ramsey oscillations. This is how you measure the coherence of the qubit. Um, and specifically, something that's interesting is you can uh, start to implement dynamical decoupling methods where you're gonna insert some pulse here and then um, through doing so, the, the, um, if you think about this as like a spin bath where you have many different spins and then there's some inhomogeneous magnetic field, those spins will begin to process at slightly different rates. And then what happens is they sort of spread out on the equator here, say, and by inserting this pulse, those spins will flip to the other side of the equator and be, sort of get the opposite sensitivity to the imperfect magnetic field and begin to come back together. And then that is how you can actually end up increasing the T2. Um, and so I think that there might be some interesting things where you can implement this and get better performance out of the qubits as well. Okay, so we've talked about single qubit gates, now two qubit gates. So, what sort of interaction you end up getting for your two qubits depends specifically on the physical hardware that uh, realization. So at IBM, we're using these resonators to couple two different qubits together. In some other situations, you may be able to couple two qubits together directly through a capacitive coupling. Um, and there's trade-offs to all these different things. Um, when you use capacitance, you end up getting a sort, different sort of interaction. But with the cross-resonance gate here, with this, um, the way that this works is you're gonna say take qubit zero and drive it at the frequency of qubit one. When you do this, this is sort of the Hamiltonian interaction that you turn on. Where on the right we have the ZX interaction. This is the, the thing that you need in order to actually create that bell state. But what comes along with it as well is this ZI and IX interactions. Um, I bring this up because this points out that the cross-resonance gate, the sort of native gate to the qubits, 
is not a C naught. And instead, you have to do sort of echo pulses to take away the excitations in these undesired states. Now, if you want a perfect Bell state, fine. That's what you have. You have to accept it. However, it's not always obvious that you need that perfect Bell state. And so you might actually be able to make your circuit more optimal and achieve the thing that you want better by not worrying about implementing these things, which is particularly true perhaps with variational circuits. So instead, you can just implement this cross resonance, not worry about the echo pulses, and then from that, your gate that was originally, say, 150 nanoseconds is now 100 nanoseconds, and you've saved some time. Which for these uh, NISC devices, saving as much time as you can is particularly important. Um, I also want to bring up, this just sort of shows how this frequency collision issue is very important. Um, so you have, and where you end up needing to be really precise with your fabrication. So you have qubit 1's F01 and qubit 0's F01, so the fundamental transition on those qubits. But what comes as well is you have, say for qubit 0, you have this F12, so that's the transition from the 1 to the 2 state. And then you have this 2 photon transition here. And you don't want any of these things matching up, because then you're not going to be able to implement the gates that you desire. Um, and so doing this heavy hexagonal code sort of helps alleviate how sensitive we are to these frequency collisions. Okay, so I've just talked about the essence of this two state. And I think that this is something that's particularly interesting and important. Um, transmons are qubits, but they don't have to be qubits. There are other energy levels. So they could be q trits, q quartz. I think you can go up, I've seen papers where people go up to level five. Once you start going above that, you sort of jump out of this well here. Specifically, I'm going to just talk about the two-state. And what is it that you can begin to do with this two-state? Well, one, through this two-photon process I mentioned before, you can begin to measure the anharmonicity of the qubit. So what is the spacing between 0, 1, and 1, 2? And what's interesting, for the transmon specifically, that ends up being proportional to the charging energy. So proportional to how much capacitance you have here. And then the omega-0, 1 is dependent on both the charging energy and the Josephson energy. So through measuring this anharmonicity, you now can fully characterize your transmon device and know precisely what its EJ is and what its EC is. Then from that, be able to know what your 0, 1, 1, 2, 2, 3, and you, you know the qubit fully, which I think is really cool. And you couldn't do that before. Another thing I think might be interesting to, to some folks in the room here is that you can actually start to do sort of cycling on these states. So I can go from, uh, make a pi pulse from 0 to 1, 1 to 2, and 2 to 0. Um, and I, I've been told that has some interesting per, uh, uses in CS. Another thing that you can do once you have access to these higher energy states is you can measure the effective temperature of the qubit. So ideally, the qubit would be at 15 millikelvin because the fridge is at 15 millikelvin. However, there's quasi-particles that end up heating these devices up. And how much they heat up the devices will vary throughout the day. And again, you can go and measure this temperature. And the T1 and T2s end up being related to this temperature. I, I don't really know what that relation is or if it's even really well understood. Um, but you can go through using this uh, excited state, you can now begin to sort of take some Boltzmann distribution and see how much population you have in the excited state. And then from that, begin to understand what is the actual temperature of the device, since it's not going to be in thermal equilibrium, most likely. And then the other thing um, that I just want to bring up here is that, uh, so this was from Fred Chung's group at the University of Chicago, um, where they proposed this sort of new generalized to Foley gate, where instead of using another qubit is your ancilla, you replace that ancilla qubit with occupation in this two state. And in the, the uh, ultimate limit, you actually end up getting some gain from this. So I think that there might be interesting space to explore here. One, one bit of caution, I guess, I want to exercise is that the, the, the issue with these devices is the 0, 1 transition, the T1s and the T2s aren't the infinite thing that we want them to be. Um, and that problem becomes a little bit worse when you start dealing with the 1, 2, or the 2, 3. Um, I don't think that that means that it's going to be not useful, so I still think people should explore it, but I just want to exercise some caution that the, the circuit depth issue will be even more relevant when you start dealing with these higher energy levels. 
Okay, so I've talked about effectively everything now. So qubit control, qubit readout. And now I just wanna get into this um, error mitigation technique of Richardson extrapolation. Uh, before I do that though, um, with these pulses, you can right now very easily, well not very easily, but begin to program your circuit from the bottom up. So you can go calibrate your gates, add whatever X gate, Z gate, whatever gate you wanna add, and build it up that way. However, if you're not necessarily interested in that, you wanna just deploy this Richardson extrapolation technique without having to worry about all these underlying details. Well, before you would take this circuit that you have with a Hadamard gate and a CNOT, and you would transpile this to the back end and we say we call it U2 gates instead of a Hadamard. Um, well, now you can also schedule this. So you can take whatever quantum circuit you have and schedule it to its pulse form. And then with these pulses, they'll be parameterized so that you can now easily sort of take whatever quantum circuit you have, create the appropriate schedule for it, parameterize it and set two different amplitudes or two different durations, and then from that begin to deploy this Richardson extrapolation technique, which I'll talk about in just a second. Um, I also think that this might end up being a way in which you can do new sorts of variational algorithms instead of updating these parameters of angles, you can update, say, the amplitudes here and that might be interesting. Uh, so Richardson extrapolation, I like this quote, um, making lemonade when a quantum computer gives you lemons. So we're gonna have these lemon quantum computers that aren't gonna be great, so we're just gonna make some lemonade with it and get, get the best that we can with it. So this technique, what, what, what is the main idea here? Well, you're gonna take whatever quantum circuit you're interested in, they have some characteristic pulse duration and amplitude, and what you're gonna do is you're gonna stretch that pulse out and then decrease the amplitude. And by doing so, you end up getting the exact same gate, this gate just took longer. And because this gate ended up taking longer, you now are sort of amplifying that decoherent noise of the qubit. If you stick it just sort of first order, this ends, you can use this to do a linear extrapolation to some ideal value in which there was no noise. But you can also go to higher orders as well. Uh, one thing I want to say that's important and will be obvious as to why it's important is that you have to be in this sort of linear regime in, in the gates in that when you take this pulse and increase its duration for twice as long, if you kept the amplitude fixed, then you should do twice the rotation. Um, if that isn't the case, which is uh, true when these gates are very fast, this uh, Richardson extrapolation technique doesn't actually work very well, or it, it doesn't, it may work, but it, it's not gonna be the, the simple thing that it is now. Okay, so, so how does this work? Well, first we're gonna start off with trying to deploy this technique with single qubit gates. So uh, it's cut off here, but the y-axis is the population in the ground state, and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start off with my qubit in the ground state, and I'm gonna just take all these Clifford operations and just do whatever varying number of them. Ultimately, they comprise the identity. So if I had a perfect qubit with perfect gates, this red line right here would be a very, very boring flat line up at one. Unfortunately, gates aren't perfect, qubit isn't perfect, so this line sort of decays as you start increasing the number of Cliffords. Well, I can take that, take the characteristic duration of any one of these Cliffords and increase it, and what you'll see is that you decay sort of faster. And this right here is the demonstration of increasing the noise, uh, the decoherence noise of your qubit. Well now you can use that and extrapolate to some better value. And you can do that to first order, second order, or third order. And as you go higher you end up, you win, but you're not necessarily gonna win indefinitely. And there's a few reasons. Um, one, again, is just this decoherent limit. So as you extend this, you're gonna ultimately run into the decoherence of the qubit, so by extending it any longer, you're not gonna necessarily win. Um, so this does come at an increased sampling cost, but it's only linear, so I think it's actually still quite useful. Um, all right, two qubit gates. So now we're gonna do this two qubit uh, gate where we're gonna create our bell state and then do the same idea. Clifford ultimately comprising the identity. Again, if Perfect qubits, perfect gates. This would be a very boring flat line up at one. It's not. 
increase the duration, worse performance, but you can extrapolate to some better value. Um, I want to point out here, we only did first order mitigation for these two qubit gates, and this is where that linearity assumption that I was telling you uh, becomes important. So the cross resonance gate, when it's tuned up to be its most optimal performance just by itself um, for a gate time of 100 nanoseconds or so, um, that is not in this linear regime. So in order to actually deploy this with the cross resonance gate, you have to slow that cross resonance gate down a bit and then you can deploy this technique. Um, nonetheless, uh, you can actually use this to still get performance. So this is, say, um, some VQE type problem where for each iteration, each trial step, I'm going to run my circuit, going to run it again with some slightly longer pulse duration, and I'm going to, when I increase that pulse duration, the decoherent noise amplifies, and then I can't actually end up, or, or my, my results sort of plateau at this value that's further away from the known answer, but then I can extrapolate it to some better value. And now you end up using this, so say this is a disassociation profile for lithium hydride. Um, this was back in 2017 before actually deploying this Richardson extrapolation technique. But take this Richardson extrapolation technique and you end up fitting right along the profile. So it sort of shows that you end up getting better performance. I do want to say, so I said at the top, this is a very general technique, and I think that's the powerful component of it, is that it doesn't matter what your variational circuit is, it can be applied to NLP variational circuits or whatever it may be. Um, and that comes true, or rings true in this option pricing paper coming from JPMC. I just want to point, point out one caveat. Um, this uh, Richardson extrapolation technique on the, the left, or yeah, your left, uh, use this pulse level extrapolation. Um, the folks at JPMC, we hadn't yet made open pulse available. And so they accomplished the same spirit of this extrapolation through adding C naughts, um, where two C naughts end up comprising the identity. Uh, the, and, and what's really cool is this works. Um, however, it's not obvious if it works as well as the pulse level. Um, in particular, as you start to add mini C knots, you're gonna end up having um, more sensitivity to the coherent noise of the devices where this technique doesn't work as well. Um, so I think that this is an area of study where somebody maybe could just sort of um, empirically see if there's better performance one way or the other or if it's the same. That is my talk. So thank you for the interesting talk. Uh, do we have any questions? Hi. Uh, thank you for the talk. It's really interesting stuff. Um, so I'm a theory guy, so this might be like a super obvious thing. Um, but you say your readout is like 90% uh, fidelity. But then like, and you do, if you do a single qubit gate, you're sort of trying to find this optimal where like, uh, like for the, the say the, the the x gate where like you go from I say like a plus state and you wait until it's a minus state and you sort of try to find when it's exactly 180 degrees around. Like how do you get it like to be very close if your readout is only 90% correct? Like isn't there like fundamental limit to how close you can like, see to get there? So so there's definitely some limits. I guess I just want to point out that you're talking about two different things sort of. So there's there's the qubit calibration which is the thing where you're calibrating the rotation for, to, from zero to one, and then there's the readout calibration. And you, th those two things are sort of done separately. Um, but uh, yes, there are limits, ultimately. And, and one thing that you can do to try and sort of push those limits um, further is the, the amplifiers for our readout. Um, you can start to use quantum limited amplifiers um, which IBM uses, so they have Joseph's and parametric converters, which are these amplifiers that look very similar to transmons, but actually have Joseph's injunctions that are larger and end up getting, uh, giving you some amplification that doesn't have as much noise if you use a hemped amplifier. Um, so it's the first stage. So you have this JPA or JPC followed by a hemped. Um, and that's one way in which you can improve the, the readout fidelity. Yeah, you mentioned that not sticking to exactly a C-naught and not taking this one term, that you save some time. 
do you also save in terms of noisiness? Um, yes, in the sense that you are implementing fewer gates. So, so it's, it's two benefits. Yeah, yeah. Hi, thank you for the talk. I have a question. Maybe I'm confusing two things, but okay. Um, so I didn't read up on it all, but in my head, in this error mitigation business, there are like two predominant techniques, not counting subspace detection, which is the extrapolation one and the quasi probability distribution one, right? And this yeah. is the TEM and IBM one as well, yes. in particular. So the thing you're talking about, it's not the quasi probability distribution one, right? Correct. And, and why are you not talking about the quasi probability um, distribution one? I, is there I, something I, limited in the, in the open pulse? Uh, so I, I'll just be honest, I'm not talking about it because I don't know it too well, um, but also because the, uh, this is the technique that I know is available in OpenPulse. I, I would need to understand that one more to know if it matters for OpenPulse specifically. Uh, hi, thanks for the interesting talk. I have one question. So the rotations that you tune, say I start with the pulse that represents an S gate and I apply it for half the time. Is it obvious that I get a T gate out or can it be that, you know, like when you tune up the device, the rotation in the block sphere is like you go around seven times, then you hit the S gate. So if I take half the time I end up somewhere completely Yeah, else. so um, you ask a question that I've been meaning to ask internally to know if we, um, so we have our X gate to go from zero to one, let's just say square root X gate, do you just take your X gate and have the duration? Um, I think that that's certainly an option. Whether that's the optimal way to do it, I don't know, and so I, I, I don't know if there's some calibration routine that you can use for both to sort of finally adjust. I suspect that if you finally adjust your X gate, then, then cutting it in half, assuming you've tested this linearity assumption, should work well. But I, I guess that's where it would break down, is this linearity when you're going very fast. So maybe in the interest of time, we'll have the coffee break now. Um, if there's any more questions, I guess feel free to alternate then. So let's thank our speaker again.